Welcome to Apologia and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. Okay, Dr. Purdom's not here today. Let me introduce her the way she normally does. Hi, this is Answers News Live. Zeus, help me, but sometimes I feel sorry for Georgia. But she's away today, so I'm going to introduce it. Hey, g'day. This boat won't float. Wherever there's inequality, atheists show up. I wouldn't give two bits for your cubits. This story is a fairy tale. Guys, guys, Seth, Arn, what are you doing? We are standing up to the lies of Answers in Genesis. This isn't an Answers in Genesis show. We're against Ken Ham here. He hates me personally. Oh, our mistake. I've been here before. I should have known that. On this show, we fight Ken Ham from behind the desk. You want to come back and give it a shot? Sure. Let's do it. This past Saturday, 7th of July, was the two-year anniversary of the Ark being open to the public. Now, the Ark only, the, the real Ark, Noah's Ark only had to float for about a year. Right. And then they left the Ark. Right. So ours is it was abandoned. Longer. Ours is two years old and it's not abandoned. All right. That's true. That's it's, what I'm talking about. Yeah, atheists are real upset about that. Wait, I thought you guys were there on Saturday. But Ken didn't say anything about you. To borrow a phrase... Were you there? We were there. There were about 150 of us. Marching two by two all the way up to the entrance of the Ark Encounter, holding our placards, singing songs. In fact, as the march began, the soundtrack in the background over the sound system at the protest was Flintstones. Meet the Flintstones. <laughs> it was just awesome. <laughs> and the Ark was not looking good. I know they're bragging that they built this thing that's lasted for two years because it's a facade. It's not an actual boat. It's just a wooden wall of a building that's set on a concrete foundation is supported by three other buildings on the other side of it. They're all actual buildings. And this thing had modern rivets and braces and everything. There's steel all the way through this thing. This was clearly designed by engineers with a lot of experience in shipbuilding, but it's not designed to be a ship. It's designed to be a building. And that's why it has all these reinforcement braces and air conditioning ducts and everything. They had to have all of these things because you wouldn't have been able to live in the ark with all, especially not with all those animals, if you didn't have that. And even if you had all that, you still couldn't live in an ark with all those animals that it was supposed to have. But when they were building this thing, we saw waterproofing that was being, you know, modern like DuPont chemical waterproofing sheets that was being put over all the wood on the exterior. But now when you go look at it, even with all that chemical treatment, two years later, it's looking pretty rank. What is that what that is? Like a discoloration there, large section of the side front of the ark that looks like it's it's almost gray as opposed to you know the more healthy wood around it i don't know what is that yeah that's what i think it is is it's a combination of the sun and water this thing could not withstand rain in the first few months of its existence there were problems because of the rain ken makes this side comment that atheists are upset but he does that all the time is it possible he didn't know you were there? Oh, he knew. There were people that work for him. As a matter of fact, the guy that gave me the guided tour when I first went, you know, two years ago, that guy, Tony, if, if I can remember his name, he gave me this tour of the ark, and we were looking at these stuffed animals that they had built in there, and I was explaining what was wrong with each one of them. Most importantly, when we came to the, the mini Tyrannus that they'd created in there, it was supposed to be the beginning of the Tyrannosaur kind. And I asked him, you know, there's something missing here. Can you see what it is? Where are the feathers? Because every dromaeosaurid is now known to have had feathers. Where are they on this? You know, of course, Answers in Genesis cannot admit that there were feathers on dinosaurs. Why not? Which is becoming increasingly a problem because we're finding more and more that we know that there were some dinosaurs that did not have feathers. You know, Trachodon and I think uh, um, uh, Carnotaur, but you know, there's not many of them. It looks like there were feathers of some sort of plumage on an awful lot of them. So you saw Tony again last weekend. Yeah, and I asked him, can we get on camera and we can just talk about why there are no feathers on your dromaeosaurs? And he flat refused. I met a guy who was a believer. I don't know if he was a rep from the Ark or not, but he, he was there to proselytize. His name was, I kid you not, Seth. And so we had a moment. Oh, Seth, nice to meet you. Nice to meet a fellow Seth. You know, because one thing we have in common is we were one of the sons of Adam and Eve who didn't just screw up everything for the rest of humankind. And uh, so we were talking and he was giving us the shtick about Jesus' teaching and whatnot, but it was obvious that the atheists that he was engaging at the protest largely had a much greater knowledge of his faith and Bible than he did. And near the end of the conversation, which was amicable and pleasant, I looked him in the eye and I said, if an Islamist came to you and they ask you to believe all the stuff that you're telling us on faith, the faith that you're embracing for Jesus and the Bible, if an Islamist asked you to take their faith on faith, would you do it? And he's like, well, absolutely not. And I said, then, would you 
Consider that it's possible that you are treating your own religious belief with a different set of rules than you are treating all the others. And he admitted, yes, that's extremely possible. And at that moment, I just shook his hand and I said, thank you. I mean, thank you for an honest answer. I knew I wasn't going to convince him at that time, but it's my hope that by having a cordial, amicable conversation with an atheist in goodwill about his faith and getting him to think for himself about his own belief system, that maybe down the way we might see him participating in a future ARC protest, if the ARC is still around. That's a really admirable goal for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, to sow those seeds. And that's what got me out of it. Small step. That's an important point to bring up, too, is when you, when you want to drive the point home. When you've got them over a barrel, when they've made a, a critical admission, and you want to get them to admit that they made the admission, that's often too far for people. If you try to push them to that point, then they double down and they do that, what is it, the backfire effect. But if you are amicable and do as Seth did at that moment, that is the best way to play that because that is going to grow. That, that seed is going to germinate in their mind. Wait, is this a kinder, gentler arm? <laughs> <laughs> it's his evil twin, or not so evil twin. They trade out. They're like twins who take turns going to each other's home runes. Who knows what Arn is going to appear tomorrow? I think the facial hair Arn is sporting is traditionally the evil twin facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> It is traditionally, isn't it? I've seen a number of TV shows from the 60s that did that exact stick. So you had that one-on-one -on -one conversation, which was awesome, but you didn't fly all that way for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Why did you make the trip? What exactly were you protesting? For me, it's protesting that there's misinformation, that they're lying to children. Ken brags that he's brought in you know, millions of people every year. He's brought in millions of stooges that he's duped, and I think that's a terrible injustice. Other people were there to protest the discrimination because Ken Ham only hires people of his religious faction, and then he makes them sign waivers that they'll be celibate if they're unmarried and that sort of thing. He won't hire gays or Jews or Catholics, certainly not Muslims. So that's what a lot of other people were protesting was the active discrimination, and I was just there to protest the lies. Imagine eight people with snow shovels climbing up and down that ladder for the one window that the story said they could have. They would have all died of methane poisoning on the first day. And that is why the boat is loaded with stuffed animals. They wanted to create this illusion that you could have this boat, that Noah could build this boat. I think in my own life, you know, having been raised to believe this story is fact, you know, it's, you're a young kid, you're impressionable, you're in Christian school where they pound this stuff home and then you become an adult and you just sort of accept it. <laughs> and... You are taught to distrust science and scientists, and you're brought up in this tiny cocoon where you really don't know anything about, you know, the sedimentary layers or the non-science of flood geology or that people did not live to be five to six hundred years old back then. And more than that, you're raised with this idea that you are born broken, and the only way to be fixed is to defer to this other and live your life subservient to that other. And it's a terrible way to live. I think it's a form of child abuse to teach this stuff as fact to children. And so one of the reasons I wanted to participate was because I think there are moral stories in the Bible if you look, but Noah's Ark is not one of them, not remotely. And we need to draw a big flashing circle around this thing and say that not only is it scientifically, logistically impossible, but it is morally untenable and should be rejected by all moral creatures. You know, our children who we are teaching deserve much better. In fact, we all deserve much better. What is important is that Noah and his family then repopulated the earth, over 5,000 ethnic groups in about 4,000 years. And then Noah, the one righteous man worth saving, spent the latter part of his life naked and drunk. And his story would be documented in an anonymously written book and in modern times would be memorialized by Ken Ham, who somehow sold the state of Kentucky on the construction of a $100 million paperweight. Okay, so there was around 100 people. About 150, I think. Yeah, there was quite a few people. You can especially see it in the march. Although some of the newspapers, they weren't very friendly to us this time. They said there were dozens of protesters. <laughs> if you had a million people, you could still argue that there were dozens of protesters. There were just a whole lot of dozens. A whole lot of dozens, <laughs> yeah. Set the scene for me. What would the protest have looked like to someone driving by? Well, they would have seen this massive crowd of people that were marching along the street up to the entrance. We got to see a whole lot of people making sneery faces at us as they saw the sign that we were holding up quite a large banner that described the Ark Park as a genocide and incest park. Which is actually 
factual, and if you've been to the Creation Museum, you've seen the exhibit on incest and why, in that time period, in that context, incest was perfectly okay. Like, Ken Ham has an exhibit defending incest, so we really shouldn't have a problem with incest being on our banner, I wouldn't think. Yeah, and it was good for starting conversations, uncomfortable conversations with parents and their kids. The enthusiasm of the people was palpable. It's funny, people paint atheists and protesters in general as just these awful, angry people, but we were having a ball. We had music playing. There was food being served. We were hanging out, making friends. There were podcasters doing interviews. I was shooting some video. We had just a festive atmosphere. I mean, it's so much fun to expose this particular story and to do so right near the entrance of the Ark Encounter that we were having a ball. So while Ken Ham or anybody else might want to paint the atheist as these malcontents who are sitting over there with black clouds you know, over their heads and black smoke coming out of their ears, the truth was we, we were having a great time. In fact, when we were done, we all gathered over at Jim Helton's house and we spent the rest of the day together. There was a whole lot of people at Helton's house. I mean, a lot of people. They were doing board games and feasting. It was a good old time. You were playing a game where you, did you kill Hitler or were you trying to defeat Hitler? I'm trying to remember. I didn't play, I'm not much of a board game guy. I was there for the conversation mostly. Okay. Somebody was playing a game about defeating or killing Hitler. It was bizarre. It was, it was, a, it was wild. You get a bunch of nerds and geeks together who are also atheists and fans of pop culture, political culture, sci-fi fantasy, and I don't know, 10 other genres. We played a game called Werewolf where it was the werewolves versus the villagers. <laughs> People were going out. <laughs> now, the thing for me was I loved the fact that uh, the creationists showed up and where the Answers in Genesis actually sent people over or that you know they came together. But they were more an intelligent group than the first group of counter-protesters. I unfortunately didn't get to engage with them, which was the biggest thing I was looking forward to going out there. I got some video of talking to one or two believers, but unfortunately, because of the sound system, they were playing so much festive music that you can't really make out the audio, so I can't use it in my videos. But that's really what I was there for, is the rare occasions when you have people that are going into this knowing that they're going to have that conversation, they're prepared to have that conversation, and we can engage. There's a place in London, I think it's Hyde Park, and they have a place in Hyde Park called Speaker's Corner. And there, on any given Sunday... You can go and just argue about religion with a whole bunch of creationists or, or Muslims or whatever. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different conflicting perspectives, and they go there looking for that debate. And that's great fun. And I've only been able to do it once. I wish we had something like Speaker's Corner out here so we could just go and do that on any given Sunday. That would be brilliant. But th that's what I was looking forward to at this event. Instead of like Twitter where they throw virtual flame, you could go and actually throw real flame at each <laughs> other for fun all the time. I toured the Ark Encounter and made a video about it last year called Atheist at the Ark Encounter. Essentially, I paid the money so that nobody else would have to. And as I'm walking through and seeing the exhibits, I look around at the types of people who are touring and attending, the people who came on purpose to see this thing. And I'm not trying to stereotype, but I will say I saw a ton of what had to be young homeschool groups, these religious homeschoolers who are probably involved in an ACE type homeschool program where the science books are anything but science books. And they are being told to fear the rest of the world and everyone in it. And they were just being carted through like little ducklings. And they were lapping all this stuff up, wide-eyed, looking at the dinosaurs and looking at all the great big exhibits and the fancy woodwork and the huge model of the Ark. And to them, it was, you know, at least for the first 10 minutes until they got bored, it was Christmas. I grieved in my heart because I was one of those kids who was raised in a cocoon. And I just wanted to take each one of them aside and say, hey, psst, you might want to double check some of this stuff <laughs> when you get a few years older. You might, or actually right now, you might go and ask your folks, you know, that they can peer review some of these claims that are being made in the Ark Encounter. Sometimes I'm asked that the kind of opposition this show, or like your in-person protest, presents to Ken Ham actually has a negative effect. They were feeding into his persecution narrative and just bringing more attention to his cause. Is that a valid concern? No, I think if he hadn't constructed or was never going to construct it, if the only light that he got was the light that was reflected through, you know, the white hot light of criticism, there might be some merit to that. But Ken was doing what Ken was doing and has been for decades. And it's not like we are converting atheists to go and believe this stuff. Sometimes the best thing you can do for a bad idea is to shine the light upon it and expose it for what it is. 
Ken's going to play the persecution narrative anyway, right? He's going to talk about the attack. I mean, have you seen, Aaron, have you, do you watch Ken Ham's Twitter feed at all? Have you seen, you know, he goes after the atheist quite a bit, right? I don't. I am already so consumed by <laughs> arguing with people that comment on my channel or that send me other messages or whatever, and people who are trying to be sincere with their crisis of faith. Those are the people that I will address, the people who actually want the real information and are, and are open to it. Yeah. If I were to pay attention to somebody like Ken Ham's Twitter feed, I would be all day <laughs> long arguing against... You know, that's the funny thing. I, I tried looking at Ray Comfort's Twitter feed once upon a time, and I just remember that there's so many lies all at once. There's no way for a team of experts to be able to, to correct all those lies on any given afternoon. <laughs> We've got to have lives. There just aren't enough hours in the day, man. Frankly, I'm shocked. You haven't already been blocked by Ken Ham's Twitter account. My account was blocked almost as soon as I posted my first tweet. When I posted my Atheist at the Creation Museum video, it's weird that he totally allows video camera and recording equipment in his exhibits. Considering he's charging 40 whatever dollars for admission plus 10 bucks to park, it's bizarre that he has no restrictions on that. So I just went in and took a camera and I posted Atheist at the Creation Museum and he posted it on his Facebook page. And of course, he used it as an opportunity to lament the atheist and blah, blah, blah. But I thought to myself, he's not bothered at all. There have been other people that have made videos where they show themselves being accosted by security, demanding that they cannot take pictures or video in the Ark Encounter. Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't see a written placard. I had, didn't see anything anywhere on the website. Honestly, if I had an exhibit and it was a proprietary exhibit, I would probably want people to have to pay to go see what it was. But, you know, if they're not going to... I can understand why you're confused at that, because when I went through, I had people from Answers in Genesis leading the tour on video. <laughs> they knew they were being video. <laughs> Now, you have a reputation. Aaron has a reputation. I don't know if they know you as Aaron, or do they know you as that big, tall guy? What, what's, what were they calling you before you showed up? So somebody complained that they were worried that big guy from Texas would be there. <laughs> that's all you got to hear. And that's all you got to hear. <laughs> big guy from Texas, that's all you got to hear, and you know who they're talking about. That's awesome. Before we move on to their news stories, anything else we should know about the protest? There were a lot of, I say a lot, at least they were vocal criticisms of why would you give this guy any oxygen? And Jim Helton addressed it from the stage. Ten Ham in the Ark Encounter wants to teach the controversy in public schools that the earth is only 6,000 years old. In Kentucky, it is legal to do Bible studies and teach the Bible in class. What? Our sex ed is abstinence only till marriage and is based on their belief system. They're against birth control, abortion letting our transgender friends pee in peace, against dying with dignity, the death penalty, climate change, and equality for all. They are not leaving us alone. We must not leave them alone. And what we have done with this protest is bring that to everyone's attention, that this is immoral, and it's not just about the ark itself. It is a symbol of what's wrong with Kentucky. And I think it needs to be addressed as often as possible that... I don't want to be the guy and you don't want to be the person who just opts out in the face of insanity and immorality and the teaching of bad ideas, especially to young and impressionable children. And we've got to call it out when it happens. Now, granted, there are some ideas in people that if you don't give them oxygen, they will go nowhere. And so there definitely has to be an assessment, a cost-benefit conversation. But Ken Ham is well-funded. He is influential. He's essentially got the governor in his back pocket, from what I can see, in Kentucky. That ship has sailed, and we need to be protesting bad ideas to see them defeated in favor of better ideas. And that's the case in every aspect of our lives. And the art just begs to be protested against. <laughs> when Bill and I did this thing, I had the pleasure of being there on the first day that the Ark was open, that I walked through the Ark next to Ken Ham and Bill Nye. As a matter of fact, if you watch the video that Ken Ham later posted on that, you can see me in the background in a couple of shots. But that was probably the best time to go through that Ark, and I don't intend to ever do that again. But I did run into people there that needed to be corrected on an awful lot of their misinformation. And when they did that debate between Bill Nye and, and Ken Ham, the beautiful thing was when they put them both side by side on CNN, and he had people on CNN that were not interested at all in talking to Bill Nye. They wanted to talk to the crazy person <laughs> who believed the stupid stuff. <laughs> like, you really, re you really believe, you're not just kidding, you actually believe. 
It was a Creation <laughs> Museum employee, I guess, who was asked years ago if all of the animals were vegetarians before the fall of humankind. Why would the T-Rex have the large incisors? And the answer was... The T-Rex used them to crack coconuts, and I believe that answer was given by a Creation Museum employee, and it made national news. I mean, when you're dealing with that level of just wrongness, sometimes you got to draw a big circle around it, and it'll be self-refuting. And a lot of these people, they treat the word believe differently than we do. If I say I believe something, it means that I don't know it to be true. This is what I think is true, but I don't know it to be true. And I don't know it to be true only because I can't show that it is true. And if I can't show that it's true, then I can't know that it's true, so on. But believers are called believers because they make believe. They simply assert things as fact that are bare spaceless speculation and pretend to know what they don't know. That's what believing is all about. It's talking out of your ass and making up stuff. Well, speaking of talking out of one's ass, should we continue on with Answers News? Sure. Cool. Churchgoers stick around for theology, not music or preachers. And so they were asking the question why you would consider changing churches. And the intriguing thing uh, that they particularly brought up was this, that the main reason people would consider changing churches because of the, of the beliefs, the doctrines. And a lot of churches are recognizing there's an exodus from the church. We know two-thirds of young people are leaving the church by the time they reach college age, very few returning. In fact, only 18% of millennials attend church, whereas of the older generations, going back to what's called the greatest generation, those born before 1928, it was 56% in America. Wow. So there is an exodus from the church. Those of us who've seen the statistics about church attendance, especially in the millennials, or the 30 and unders, we'll say are watching now what Ken Ham is asserting, or at least implying, I think he's asserting it right by putting the statistics up about the doctrinal differences and the reason people will leave a church. Well, that very much may be the case, that people will leave because they disagree with the doctrine. But those of us who have been raised in the church understand that people leave churches for all number of reasons. They leave for relational problems, they leave because they are moving, they leave because their tastes might have changed, or because they had some sort of a life crisis that their needs change, and so they change whatever environment they happen to be in. It's a social circle, so that dynamic's in play. But Ken is not at all addressing the role of the age of information in the millennials leaving church. The reason that they are not attending is because, quite frankly, they are non-religious. They're nuns. They don't need it. Even the Christians in name only, they don't know anything about their Bible. They don't have any idea what God or Jesus said, except for maybe a few misquoted verses. They're completely disconnected from religion because they don't need it. And so if Ken Ham wants to talk about a mass exodus from Sunday go to meeting, well, it ain't because of difference or preference in doctrine. It's because this entire generation is more and more realizing that it doesn't want to waste their Sunday morning in there. They'd rather be doing other things. They don't want to judge gay people. They are human rights people. They want to be good stewards of the planet. They aren't fundamentalists like their parents and grandparents. They simply are non-religious in their lives. And that's an inconvenient truth that Ken Ham's going to have to acknowledge at some point. I read about a poll at one point where they were talking about the, the reasons why American atheists who usually are Christian originally, they were raised Christian and, you know, convert or deconvert or walk away from the religion. There was a poll as to reason why they did that. And the number three reason is the one that you're talking about, whether it's the age of information, that the claims that the church makes or that the religion makes were contrary to what science understands. That was only no answer number three. The number two reason that people left religion was the hypocrisy of their church. And the number one reason why people have left religion in the United States to become atheists was they read the Bible. <laughs> right? Isaac Asimov, the Bible is the most potent force for atheism ever conceived. I hope I got the quote marginally correct there. What they want are answers, and they want to know the Bible's sure. real. Sure. But, but what I have noticed is music has become, in many churches, the dominant feature, because sure. they think that's what's going to change the culture and get the people in. But have a look, we're losing the culture, yeah. and we're still losing people from the church. And this research here indicates, hey, they want, they want teaching. People want teaching. People come up with religious answers. They're coming up with religious excuses. None of them are the answer. If you can twist some excuse that maybe this is what it is, you're not saying that that may be what it is. You can, you can assert it all you want, but it's not an answer if you can't show that it's true, if you can't show that it's accurate. It's one of many possibilities at best. It doesn't become the answer until you can verify, yep, this is what it is, and it's not that. It's an interesting statement, too, that he says people come because they want to know or want to be assured that the Bible is true. 
that sounds backwards to me. Like, wouldn't you seek whatever the truth is? And if the Bible happens to be true or not true, I mean, that conclusion is reached after you've assessed the evidence. Exactly right. I mean, you, people want to know what is true, not that the Bible is true, just what is true. They want to understand what the truth is. And of course, the truth is what the facts are, and that's where Answers in Genesis has a problem. Well, if you look at the mainline Protestant denominations that have gone liberal in their theology, they go missing. But we also found that the people over 65 years old, they tended to stay in their same church. Sure. They, they didn't want to move around. Hang on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hang on. Obviously, those who are older, who are more creatures of habit and tradition, are going to wander and experiment less with the churches. You know, talk about your you know routine and social circle. It's like, I've always bought a Buick. I've bought a Buick since I was 21. I'm always going to have a Buick. I mean, you see a lot. Not always. I don't, I don't want to stereotype. But we're talking about people who take a tremendous amount of comfort and they've made their choices. They live in the house they want to live in. They have the habits that they want. They don't do change very well in, in a great many instances. And so the idea that, oh, well, look at all the 65 and olders. Well, they're, you know, they're not going anywhere. And then saying it's all about teaching, for me, I think it's more of a cultural thing. It's also about what you said. You have people that appreciate tradition, and then you have people that are not going to be traditional. You know, Answers in Genesis are complaining that people are liberal, right? Or maybe the issue is that they're not conservative, right? What is progressive? It's the opposite. It means you don't adhere to or worship or cherish the good old days and the tried and true ways. You're willing to try something new if it works better. And that's what youth does. That's what progressives do. That's the positions. And obviously, creationism is a very conservative position. Maintain the traditions, maintain the tried and true or the old ways. And notice how the liberals and the progressives always get sort of lumped in as atheists. The progressive liberal atheists. I think Ken Ham likes to use the term atheist worldview or atheistic worldview. And I'm like, atheism is not a worldview. Now, it can inform a worldview, but atheists aren't sitting around in a star chamber all in agreement about everything from their political views to their philosophical views to you name it. I mean, you're talking about a huge swath of extremely diverse people. And yet, when the apologists speak about atheists, they talk about them in this weird cookie-cutter thing, like we're all going to the same kegger. <laughs> I just don't get it. And I do these programs where they bus uh, these teenagers in. I do K-6 to six and we do 7 to 12. And I, I've had thousands of these young people in auditorium at one time, and I speak to them for an hour and a half. Now I use lots of illustrations right. and so on. But... I can keep them for an hour and a half, no sure. music, just teaching. And they come afterwards, many of them, and they say, we've never had those answers before. This helps make the Bible real. Yeah. And it, it, it really does. It shows that the biology, geology, astronomy, anthropology, and the Bible is true. Yeah. And then we explain the gospel based in that history and so on. And what I found is when, when I go to churches to speak, sometimes I'm told, oh, if you're going to speak to the young people, you know, five or ten minutes, and then they lose attention. But you get up and talk about these topics of origins and Genesis and science and where they're at and the things that they've heard that contradict the Bible, and you give answers, they'll sit there for ages. I was recently invited to give a one-hour presentation on the basics of evolution and the facts to prove the theory. I was invited by a church, what I could assume could be a creationist church, because they originally wanted me to come to be on stage with a creationist and banter ideas back and forth with this other guy, but then they asked for this other thing. So I thought, this is a fantastic opportunity. I promise I will give you the best evolutionary primer that's ever been recorded, hands down. I was so excited about this. I said, I'll bring a couple of HD cameras. I'll bring somebody to handle it. I will bring my own lav mics. This is going to be great. And I called him back a, a week later and I said, well, I just want to verify the times and the locations of the venue or the room so that I can advertise and promote this. And the answer that I suddenly got was, uh, it turns out we have something else scheduled for that afternoon and we can't do that. So you're still on for the debate, but you're not going to be giving that one hour lecture. And it would have exactly contradicted everything that Ken Ham said. And I, I mean, in a way that is far beyond what Ken Ham can do. I'm not talking about putting a whole bunch of children who don't know anything, and sequestering them in the room and giving them an authority who's just going to shout lies at them. I'm talking about adults where I talk to the congregation themselves and give them the proof that they won't be able to deny. You should just do that lecture and stick it on YouTube if you, if you already got it prepared, because I mean, I'd like to share that. That'd be amazing. As it happens, I just got an invitation today to go to Denver to give a Darwin Day speech so that will be my presentation Fantastic. in Denver Fantastic. for Darwin Day. Well, I've had people tell me that I was coming out of my faith or I had doubts and I stumbled upon an R&Raw video where he was able to explain 
one person I'd spoken to said it was one of your videos on Noah's Ark, debunking Noah's Ark, that actually helped them realize it was all a bunch of crap. And then I've had several other people say that it was the way you are able to explain evolution and how it works and and how it's misrepresented by the creationists and certainly people like Ken Ham that has helped them. So, I mean, be encouraged, my friend, because the work that you're doing continues to make a difference. Thank you very much, sir. Let's get on with this next article. Neanderthal. Remember Neanderthal Man? You know, when they first talked about Neanderthal Man years ago, the evolutionists made them look like some brutish, yes. half-ape, half-human, and, you know, was, was sort of some, like, you know, much more closely related to apes and, and were not human. Right. They changed their views of Neanderthal. But, you know, they really oh, have. Nope. No, we really haven't. What was originally stated about Neanderthals, and this is going back to the earliest that I can remember in any historical record that I've ever read, They've never presented a Neanderthal as a half-ape, half-man. That's a ridiculous concept, by the way. Since humans are a subset of apes, asking for a half-ape, half-man would be like asking for a half-dachshund, half-dog, mm-hmm. or a half-mallard, half-duck. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But if you had a half-mallard, half-duck, would it be half-bird also? They always knew that Neanderthal was more recent than Homo erectus, and that Neanderthals and humans, or Homo sapiens, you know, Homo neanderthalensis, which is a human species, and Homo sapiens were both descended from Homo erectus, which was itself a human. And it also wasn't what they want to pretend is half ape, half man. They don't even have a criteria for what that would mean. Homo erectus probably would be that in some criteria if I could get people to nail down what they meant by that. But Neanderthals were never supposed to be our ancestors. What he's representing here, you know, the half ape, half man, and he's more talking about Australopithecines, which they then want to dismiss as if everybody knows they were just chimpanzees, which of course they were not, and everybody knew better. But this is the problem with creationist propaganda. It depends on lies. They have to misrepresent all the facts. You think Ken Ham possibly came to this point in his career and he didn't know better than what he just said? This may be where Arn and I part ways. I do think it's fertile ground for the charlatan and the scam artist. And there's a seriously large possibility that Ken Ham is completely full of crap. Well, he knows. Uh, He knows what the history is. You don't know what he knows. You you know that, that he's been presented information, and you know that he has, that information should have gotten through his thick skull, and that he should be assimilating it. But at the same time, if you understand the power of, of cognitive dissonance and the backfire effect and the fact that he's, you know, he's living in his particular faith, meaning he's closed off certain avenues of thought, it's very possible that he simply is just rejecting all of the new information and sincerely does believe in the six-day creation and all that. Now, I'm like you. I have my suspicion that he's just totally full of shit. <laughs> but I don't like to go that far to say, I know what he's thinking. Because I'm talking about what he's actually said, you know, when he's described in his seminars, what is actually confirmation bias, but he calls the God glasses, where you simply throw out whatever evidence you don't like and accept that the Bible is true, therefore everything else is wrong. Oh, that's fundamental Christianity. Hell, I was raised in that. You know, we were taught to distrust you sciencey people who would come at us with these quote unquote facts that had been tainted by Satan. And so we embraced the Bible and we rebuffed everything else, but we sincerely believed. And so wherever Ken Ham ends up, whether he's sincere or a businessman, a con man, a scam artist, I don't really know. But we're not mind readers. We don't know whether or not he's lying or he genuinely believes it to be true. But Well, for the moment, we'll concede that he is either willfully ignorant or deliberately dishonest, and I don't see where the difference is. I mean, was it Matt who said if he is lying, he's one of the best liars out there? The guy is 24-7, full bore, evangelical, fundamental, literal Bible, Genesis, Christianity. You know, he makes me crazy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not coming to Ken's defense. (laughs) Nobody get me wrong. When I see those kids carted in by the hundreds upon hundreds into those auditoriums, captive audiences, and uh, Aaron put it so well a few minutes ago when he was talking about the fact that they're sort of cocooned in these, you know, they are uh, sequestered is the word you used. And I'm like, yes, they bring them into this microcosm and they fill them full of bad information and then send them off confident that they no longer have to ask any more questions because they already know the truth, I honestly think it's a form of child abuse. Ken Ham is damaging the perceptions of children in relation to the real world and potentially inhibiting what they might become because they are living the rest of their lives with the belief in a sin nature, fear of hell, shame for being born, and a dependence on another to make everything make sense and do the thinking for them. The summary is that what he just said about Neanderthals and what quote, evolutionists, unquote, 
said about Neanderthals versus what they say about them today is wrong. We're still maintaining the same original message. Do you ever hear people say, don't call me a primate? And of course, I'm, I always think of you, Aaron, like, what was your first response be? Don't link me to a primate. And your response would be what? <laughs> are you a mammal or are you just linked to a mammal? Are you similar to a mammal or are you a ma actually a mammal? <laughs> Is it you have similar traits to mammals or you have diagnostic traits as a mammal? <laughs> but people don't understand it. This is why I wanted to throw it out there. It's just so good. <laughs> I've noticed that since your debate with Kent Hovind that he's become aware of the word eukaryote. <laughs> you went and looked up what the word meant, huh? <laughs> Arn, would you ever take the stage with Ken Ham? Like if Ken ever said, okay, bring it. And I was supposed to take the stage. Bill Nye was my replacement. Why did that fall through? Ken Ham was giving a keynote speech at a homeschool convention in Houston. And the Houston Atheist, which was the largest geographic atheist collective, some 2,200 members at that time, sent a message to Ken Ham challenging him to a debate. And they selected me as their champion. So they asked him to debate me. And the, the venue was going to be the Houston Museum of Natural Science. And all this had been already been set up. So Ham refused. He said he would only debate PhDs. So P.Z. Myers threw his PhD into the ring. And he said, that, you know, I'll, I'll put in my PhD on one condition. RN remains at the debate as my partner. And all negotiations stopped. They didn't respond to any further messages. They, they just weren't going to talk to us anymore. So we called their bluff, and they wouldn't do anything about it. And then three or four months later was the announcement that Bill Nye was going to do the debate. Of course, it's not going to be at a neutral venue anymore. Now it was going to be at Answers in Genesis headquarters so that they could make $20,000 on ticket sales on that one day. Obviously, the Ham-Nye debate was a watershed moment for a lot of people. But in hindsight, do you have any sense as to whether the debate was a cultural win or a cultural loss? The reason that Ham wasn't going to do the debate with me was because there's no way to win. There just wasn't. But if he did it with Bill Nye, again, there still wasn't a way to win the debate. But he did get $20,000 from the ticket sales. And his investors felt so sorry for him that they did the backfire effect. That he got his ass handed to him so bad that his investors gave him the money to do the ARC, which was the reason he did the debate in the first place. He was running out of money, other people's money, to build this big facade. Yeah, I, you know, when I first approached the debate, I thought, you know, yeah, bring it. I like Bill Nye. I don't think he was the right guy. He brings likability and he, he had some good information. I think someone like Aaron could have gone in and just really been the blitzkrieg of data that could have seen a global audience who'd been watching online. Yeah, I want to be careful about this because, I mean, while I would have won that debate too, if you had put us both in the same venue, Bill Nye was the, the choice that people would have more likely sided with. You put my, you know, Disney villain satanic <laughs> ass up there and... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess if you're looking at a style over substance, I mean, for those who see this intimidating, you know, large, dark figure come in before you realize he's like the nicest guy in the world and has a genuine heart for people and wants the truth to prevail. You know, it's easy to put Arn in a cookie cutter, especially if you're one of the religious. But looking back, I lament that it was such a fundraising opportunity. I'd like to have seen that debate carried out on neutral ground with no financial benefit or at least equal financial benefit for both. And without that caveat, in retrospect, I would like to have seen the debate not happen. I've actually changed my position because I saw he was able to translate that into funding, and that's kind of a tragedy. Now, certainly, we saw some people who were exposed to the argument. That's important. But I, I don't think the cost benefit on that debate was worth it. I'd like to see it formatted differently. And I'd kind of like to see somebody else opposing Ken Ham on stage, somebody who is an actual hardcore student of and teacher of and an about evolution and evolutionary science. Yeah, what are the requirements when the Houston atheists wanted me to debate Ken Ham? My only requirement that I can remember was that neither of us gets paid, neither of us gets to market anything while we're there. This is not going to be a money-making opportunity for either of us. And don't bring me any of that weak-ass beer. <laughs> that would be probably in his rider. Yeah, yeah. I ain't drinking <laughs> yellow. <laughs> well, I feel like we've wrapped that up with a nice little bow. Probably no reason to ruin it with any more words from Ken. 
I'd just like to say that a fool, according to the dictionary, a fool is someone who too readily believes improbable claims from questionable sources on insufficient evidence. So it's no surprise that the Bible and the Quran both give the opposite definition of what a fool is. Ah, that's a t-shirt. I mean, it's a little long, but I may have to put down on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unless the, the, the Bible says the fool said in his heart there is no God, which is supposedly a conversation stopper. Uh, I hear this in rebuttals from believers where I say, well, I don't believe. And they're like, well, the fool saith in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> like yeah. that's supposed to <laughs> and stop I say, it. And the wise say it out loud. <laughs> I think my thing would be, I came out of a culture that we thought evolution was, you know, my granddaddy wasn't no monkey. That's essentially how it was pitched to us. And, it, you know, evolution was framed so that it threatened my specialness. I was no longer going to be a child of the living God. And and the universe didn't revolve around me. And what I didn't expect when I came out of my faith was that learning as a layperson, as a civilian, about how evolution worked and life and, and the natural processes of this world and solar system and galaxy and universe and, and making every day a discovery actually made life more amazing and more special. Educating myself about how all of these mechanisms work actually made me more in awe of the natural world. So I would encourage anybody, you don't have to have a PhD or be pursuing a PhD in evolution to be able to learn and participate. So, you know, go through Orange Channel. He's got so much amazing material. He's one of our best educators on the subject. He's a great resource that should not be ignored. I've also got about an hour and 20 minute speech that I recorded of Dr. Donald Prothero, paleontologist and geologist, and I shot the speech that he gave in front of a studio audience in Dallas where he gave 90 minutes of examples of how evolution works. It's called Evolution, What the Fossils Say. You can find it easily on YouTube. You don't have to be an egghead. <laughs> you don't have to be one of those people with a hugely deep mind. You can be anybody, everybody, and you can be a part of the scientific learning process. And I would encourage everybody to get excited about learning those things and passing them on. Cool. <laughs> I, lo I love that closing line. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> the two of you here, what else is there for me to say? If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Seth Andrews' YouTube channel and find all of his details at thethinkingatheist.com or sethandrews.net. And do the same with Aaron Ra's channel via patreon.com slash A-R-O-N-R-A. Thanks so much for stopping by, guys. Thank you very much. Cool. Bye-bye. Quick reminder that there's a new Apology at Discord server where my viewers hang out, have fun, and discuss leaving religion. There's also now a line of ham and egg shirts, mugs, stickers, and things. Be like Morgan and Shannon and get yours today. Find the links in the description. Huge thanks, as always, to those who support me on Patreon and make these videos possible. If you find what I do helpful and would like to help me continue and expand, consider supporting us for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash apologia. Maybe you'll be a cartoon. To everyone, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends. Until next time. Later.